Well, welcome everyone to another exciting webcast with Feed the we Hunger. We are back. We are back. It's been it's been a while. I mean, the last one was a great webcast, but uh, fortunately for you all, Joseph and I weren't necessarily involved in that. You mm. got to hear from Melinda mostly, and also from uh, our partner Vitaly in Ukraine. So I hope you all were blessed by that. But uh, we're back mm. for more of our traditional webcast and. What an awesome opportunity or exciting time for us as a ministry in 2023. It is our 55th year of ministry at Feed the Hunger. And so we want to take some time today to just acknowledge that, give uh, thanks to God for uh, just how he's used you all over the years through your prayers, through your giving to accomplish great things uh, in his kingdom to help him, uh, to help God's church grow internationally and also here in the United States. And so we're excited because we have a special guest coming up uh, later on that you'll hear uh, uh, from, and and I think you'll all be blessed by by our special visitor. But, um, you know, we are just coming out for many of us of uh, the Easter weekend, and so uh, what a great, uh, it's always a great experience to um, just walk down that week, the Passion, everything from Palm Sunday to uh, Christ's journey to the cross, and then especially uh, the resurrection. And so we're just grateful for this gift of salvation that Christ has accomplished and purchased for all of us and redeemed us uh, from the curse of sin. So hope you all had a special time recently celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. And um, we are going to uh, have a guest come up in a little bit. But before we get to that special guest, Joseph, tell us a little bit about what's been going on uh, recently, some maybe recent outreaches that's taken place so far at the beginning of this year. Yeah, maybe I should clarify beforehand that it is our 55th year, but I am not 55 years old, despite my rapidly aging appearance. With each passing webcast, just it didn't begin with me. It began with my parents, and maybe we'll talk about that more later. But uh, the great time about this time of year, just like Christmas globally, it is a key uh, window of time for our partners to share about Jesus. And some of them are even putting their lives at risk and even uh, being martyred for their faith. For, for their sharing in these sensitive uh, situations. So you can pray for them. We, we, uh, just recently, um, we sent uh, outreach funds to help during Easter, to help with the outreach, that is, uh, in places like Togo and Pakistan. We sent Bibles all the way from Kenya to here in Kentucky. Uh, recently, we've sent containers of food to uh, Bangladesh, Ghana, Ukraine, Dominican Republic, and and I think as we speak, uh, Scott, I'm not sure if it's left yet, but haven't we, we have a few pallets headed to El Paso uh, to help yes, feed at the border. Week. We're really excited about it. We've been praying about help being able to help at the border for for several years now. Doesn't matter where you are on the issue, there are folks there that are in desperate straits. And uh, we've found some Christian partners there on the border who are feeding folks. And so pray that that uh, goes well with these initial pallets and that, that it can grow. Um, we, we help in, in many different ways, as you've heard us say before, it's more than a meal. The, the food is the door cracker for sharing the gospel, for helping people in multiple ways. So I saw, um, I'm looking at it, but I just took some notes earlier today. For example, we sent a forklift to the Ukraine to help with all the food um, unloading and, and offloading. Um, we are helping a school in Liberia with solar panels and, and with used computers because the, the grid there is so unreliable. They need to have another power source to have just have school. You know, all these things that we take right. for granted here. Uh, motorcycles in Nepal and helping folks in the Rohingya refugee camp after a fire overtook and, and just destroyed so many of their huts. So you all are helping in so many awesome ways um, this Easter season and, of course, throughout the year. Well, what, what's on the horizon next? I mean, what are uh, some things the ministry has its attention uh, geared towards coming up in the next couple months and even maybe ways that those who are uh, watching can uh, take part in, in in recent weeks? So, yeah, so last year, obviously, the Ukraine war started and the Lord very clearly opened up a door for us to help there. And so we've sent well over two and a half million meals there. 
Um, we're hoping to send more, but the problem is in this day, the news cycle is constantly changing and so many people have moved on while the need remains, just like it was with the refugee camp, but with the Rohingya people, you know, the public has moved on from that, but the door of opportunity to help is still completely wide open. So we need to pack a whole lot more food in this second quarter of the year, April, May, and June, to meet the growing need. You know, the need only got bigger after the pandemic in general and in these locations specifically. So kind of to celebrate our 55th anniversary, we're going to have a 55th anniversary packathon like we had a 50th anniversary packathon five years ago. Right. And we're going to do this in May and even and just and actually just before the packathon, we're doing our third annual golf to give back tournament. The, the pandemic really uh, broke the mold on how a tournament can take place. Right. Now you don't have to all be in one location. You can be at any course with any foursome and be a part of this tournament. And, and the great thing about the tournament is all of the proceeds from the golfers is converted into meals that will then pack at this 50th fifth anniversary packathon. So if you can give for either one of those causes, if you can participate, whether it be swinging the golf club or packing food. Uh, May is a big month of involvement that we would love to have from you all. That's right. And so those are some great opportunities coming up, um, you know, for all the golfers that are listening or friends and family with golfers, uh, please consider that because um, it's, it's, it's more than just going to the course and, and having a good time with friends uh, for those that you do that already. It, it really can impact and, uh, and improve lives. So we're going to convert all the proceeds from that tournament right into meals, as Joseph said. So uh, hopefully you'll join us that first week of May and you can play your favorite course. You can play where you're at. Uh, and so maybe you'll take advantage of that. And, and, and we also look forward to this May community-wide packathon going on in various places uh, at our permanent packing locations, as well as here uh, in, in uh, near our headquarters. Um, so, Joseph, we're going to bring in our special guest right now and and uh, introduce this person to everyone. And so many are going to know who this person is the second they, they see uh, the person. But uh, uh, we're going to welcome in our um, special guest at this point in time. So I'm just going to let her appear on camera and we'll get to see who she is. And so Pat Williams joins us now as our co-founder, uh, as we're talking about our 55 year anniversary here in 2023. And so Pat, thank you for taking time uh, today sure. to join us. And there's lots of our listeners, our watchers that uh, know you well, and I'm sure they'll be excited to hear you talk about just the 55 years of ministry and the things God has brought Feed the Hunger through. So let's get started. We're just going to ask you some questions and, and you can uh, take us down memory lane with you, so to speak. Okay, I'm ready. Yeah. So, you know, Mother, the first trip was August 9th through 26th, I believe, uh, 1968 to Mexico. Right. Drove down. Is that right? Did you drive down? We drove in an unair un conditioned YMCA plus. Mm which had yes. enough memories of its own, I'm sure. Oh, but I'm sure. The ministry aspect or, or mentoring and discipling young kids actually started at the beginning of that summer. So tell us a little bit about that. It really started because JL's brother Ed was already here at in Burlington uh, working at the YMCA and he wanted help with the teenage program. So JL and I were between places to live. So we came to live here and, uh, they had the, those guys had the idea to work with the high school students, the presidents, vice president, secretary, and treasurer of all five of the high schools in Alamance County. And he brought them together for, uh, first of all, leadership training, and secondly, for um, Bible study. And it was mm. such an awesome experience to get to know those kids because those kids were already so self-motivated because they were in the highest positions in their class in their schools. And um, so then JL and I wanted to give them a mission experience. So at the end of the summer, we ha got all those kids together and took them to Mexico on a bus in the heat. Wow! And it was an awesome experience. Awesome. Yeah. It's still amazing that some kind of event like that even took place where these different high schools leadership would come together. I mean, I'm not sure the last time that's probably happened. And so 
it was the second year after the scene group was formed at the end of that trip. It was the second year that you all desired to integrate the scene group. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, it was always our passion because we were so inclined for missions to include every race of person in the singing group. And so it was really, though I have to say, David Maynard, Coach David Maynard from Jordan Sellers High School, before segregation was over, who also joined with us in this vision to get black kids and white kids together because we felt like with racial reconciliation, you had hope for a future, hope for Alamance County, especially all these kids that could have been into a lot of trouble had they not had some kind of encouragement. So it was very exciting to see how well, even from the very beginning that these kids got along together and when uh, the, some of the rioting in other cities was going on, were going on, and it was difficult to break through the racial barriers, these students, a lot of these students were part of the solution. And it was really great to see in Burlington as well, especially when there were tanks in the street and those kinds of things going on. I think I had two kids by then, so... You weren't yet born, Joseph. I was a twinkle, but I, I did come along at some point. Not even a twinkle. Uh, no, not a twinkle. <laughs> but my summers were spent on the tour bus, and I was spoiled to see blacks and whites getting along wonderfully because that wasn't the case in many parts of society. Um, but over the years, obviously, missions was there from the beginning, and it kind of transitioned over the period of, I don't know, maybe the first 20 years of the ministry to, from – yeah. interracial to cross-cultural to so talk a little bit about the how it expanded to global yes yeah, so jl was invited to by a good friend jim seymour to go to zimbabwe because they were also beginning their racial racial reconciliation and instead of being north and south rhodesia northern and southern rhodesia they wanted to go back to their original name which was zimbabwe and so J.O. got invited to go and bring, a, a, as was called, a salt and pepper team, which meant J.O. was the white and uh, Paul Smith was the black. And they toured through Zimbabwe into military bases and everywhere. And that just kind of caught J.O. on fire. And he realized that instead of being with the teenagers in America, as much as we had loved that, that it was time for him to go overseas and preach and teach and work for racial reconciliation over there. Yeah. And so, Pat, as you guys developed uh, a lot of international ministry in multiple countries, uh, looking back, can you just share some of your best memories uh, of, on the international side of, of partnering with our national partners and assisting them in what God's called them to do? Well, it's just so exciting to to travel overseas and to be with these national partners who, in my opinion, have so little and yet do so much. And I, on the other hand, who have so much, do so little. So it was always challenging. It was always a blessing. It didn't mean it was easy, but it meant it to see God, how God worked in the third world was just a mind blow. My mind still goes back to that. And there were several stories, one um, in particular that I remembered. Uh, we were going up into the lower part of the Himalaya mountains and we were. I was going to do a women's conference. And we go into the church, church, which was made of, of the bamboo strips all around and a thatched roof. And uh, I'm sitting on the floor with the ladies because you do that in Nepal without your shoes on, of course. And the mamas and the babies um, were in the back of the church and the babies don't have diapers. So, and there's no childcare and there's no air conditioning, but there's a big, there was a big uh, water buffalo outside the front door, door meaning sort of, and he's Open. going Whoa, like that. And then the roosters are crowing and one woman outside that I could see through the slit in the bamboo she is wrestling with a couple chickens that are going to make it into the stew later. And so that all of that noise is going on. But see, here is the most amazing part. Those women never stopped 
to look at any of the things I was looking at. They were always focused and always listening and nothing distracted them. It, it just uh, challenged me so much. When I got up to speak, I mean, all that stuff is still going on. The chickens, the, the water buffalo, the children, uh, the diapers not evident and no chairs to sit on, but how amazing it was. And most of those women were illiterate, but there were enough women in the congregation in that group that could translate later on. So, I mean, it's just a blessing, just been a blessing. It's like a word picture of what hungering and thirsting for righteousness really means. Yeah, right? right. Very good. That is so true. Yeah. It became a global ministry and my, you know, he, he preached everywhere. He taught everywhere and he stepped down. What about 15 years ago and liked it so much. He just kept going Yes. And so, and then Feed the Hunger became Feed the Hunger because we took all the things that daddy was doing and tried to narrow it down to those most basic hungers. And he really focused the last season of his life on mentoring these national partners, right? Yes, there were so many. Yeah. I wanted to say that when he died, I was helping him correspond with about 40 men overseas in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. And it was his great passion. Even when he started not feeling so great, of course, we didn't know how bad it was going to be. But yeah, he, he just loved to be on his computer and he wanted to get over there as fast as he could. And yeah, he just loved to mentor. He really did. So yeah, so how has it been? You know, it's been over six years now since he was taken from us suddenly with a massive heart attack, which also is the way his father went to heaven. Yeah. So I'm planning on that as well. Are you? Blaze of glory. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but how has it been without him these last six plus years? Well, I think I had a good start at the beginning, um, of course, with the Holy Spirit and the Lord and my wonderful family surrounding me and overseas partners. Oh, one of those. Yes. Pointing <laughs> to you. <laughs> oh, my. Um, that. I went to a grief share class at my church and uh, what I learned there was that nothing had been taken from me that could keep me from living the victorious Christian life. And if I had expected JL to be all of that for me, my emphasis was in the wrong place. And that has stayed with me all these six years and will continue because I found it to be true for the Lord to be my husband, um, for me not to despair in that doesn't mean it's easy. It just means that it's possible to live the victorious Christian life. And I'm so grateful for scripture, prayer, friends, small group, family, and family. Yes, <laughs> excuse me, family. <clears throat> wow. Yes. That is, no, that's that's a powerful uh, testimony there, Pat. Um, you know, uh, I've been with the ministry for. 20 years now and uh, you and I for a brief time actually we had neighboring offices uh in in the building and so forth right. and now you're fully yeah. retired so can you just uh let everyone know what it's been like for you the last just uh really recently so it's just been a couple of years yeah. that you've been fully retired so what is retirement life like for you well JL always said there's no such thing as retirement of course I didn't always agree with him on that but uh that you were supposed to, you could retire, but you were supposed to be refired and redeployed. So my redeployment has, instead of the worldwide thing, it's gotten a little bit smaller. And I am meeting with women, basically. And uh, of course, you have to throw in helping with grandchildren because they're so very important. Um, I have written some books since JL died. Of course, JL said, he always wanted me to write a book. You know, he always wanted that. He kept pushing it. And I, I said, no, I don't think so, J.L. I'm too busy editing your books. And then two weeks before he died, of course, we didn't know it was going to be two weeks. But he said, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to die. And then you'll write, write a book. And we both laughed and thought that was really a funny thing. But that's 
uh, in reality what happened. Thank you, Feed the Hunger, for the, helping me with all of that and everybody's help in getting it set up and out there. So, yeah, I, I'm Vincent keeps asking me if I'm going to write some more. So, Will, I'm working mm -hmm. on that. Vincent being our graphic designer who would then yes. get the book converted and ready for everybody to read. And as you know, it's been one of my joys to get the last laugh with dad that um, we re-released some of his books in a little bit more condensed form. Yes, yes. Because he was very thorough when he released the book. He had to cover every possible angle. You know, why quote two verses when 16 will do better? <laughs> yeah. So do you have plans for another book? Uh, I would certainly like to. In fact, I had a recent thing that happened recently uh, that would make a good chapter. So maybe. We'll see. So you're not going to release a book. You're just going to release the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. That's Thank about you, how Joey. short people's attention spans are. So maybe it's a brilliant idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, we just have a few more questions, Pat. We're going to switch gears a little okay. bit. We just have some fun questions um, that uh, we just want to ask you when you're here. Yeah, we normally we normally end these. We normally end these with a couple of questions from folk for me. But yeah, we thought, why not just keep you on and then make things more uncomfortable for you with other questions? Right. So. <laughs> this one's easy. Uh, they get increasingly more difficult, I think. Um, uh, what is one of your favorite countries to travel to? I what love the continent, uh, the continent of Africa. I did. I found them so gracious and kind and attentive. But all of, yeah, all of the countries were that way. But I really enjoyed Africa, the different countries we were in. I think I was in five or six of them where I experienced that kind of hospitality and graciousness. Yeah. Well, as we know, uh, Daddy's wish was to have his ashes scattered. Was, was to first die in Africa and then be forced to then have his ashes scattered there rather than buried here. Um, but it, yeah, it's hard to pick one country for sure. Um, but what was one of the toughest things you had to <laughs> endure with him? Often it was the accommodations, I know, but. Yes, as, as you will remember that uh, he always took us to five-star hotels when we were overseas. You remember that, which meant that when you laid down and looked up, you could see at least five stars above you because the accommodations were basic. Holy. But it was they also holy. learning. <laughs> they were, they were holy. You could holy. see the holes. <laughs> oh, boy. Yes. Um but th those were also challenging. And um, I think at one point you had an experience of having to room with him in a place. Yes. Well, you know, his saying, what he feeds me. Well, it wasn't his, right? He stole that from somebody and then he built on it. What he feeds me, I will swallow. Where he leads me, I will follow. And then the late addendum was where he lays me, I will lays wallow. Me. Yes. Oh, right. <laughs> and I have wallowed with him all over the world as you have. And live to tell about it, although I'd like to blame certain things for the trauma that took place, such as yes. Off. But yes, I've been with him where we stayed in was some sort of motel in the in remote Nepal where you stepped down into the room. It felt like you were going into a bunker. And th the good news was we weren't going to be in the same bed. The bad news is the bed did not look welcoming. And of course, that didn't bother Daddy at all. He just hopped right in, stripped down to just his boxers, and went to sleep. And the whole night, whereas I kept all my clothes on, laid on the top like I was a mummy, and just prayed that the Lord would, you know, protect me through the night. When he woke up the next morning, he had bed bugs lining where he had gripped the pillow with his whole arm up his neck. So I didn't envy him preaching as he felt the effects of those bed bug bites, but yes, yum. Yeah. Well, <laughs> not more enough about me. What's your story? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember one probably in, it may have been the same hotel later on, not the same <laughs> time you were there, but yes, um, we got there and the 
uh, the sheets and the towels were just really dirty. So JL called the management and they came up and he said, we need clean sheets. And he's, and the manager could not understand why we needed clean sheets. He said, but, but only three other of our people have used them over the last three <laughs> days. But why isn't this sufficient? Mm. So anyway, jail convinced them. So we got clean towels and then the room had been swept, but over in the corner was where it, everything had been swept too. So there was this pile mm. of trash and all this stuff in the corner. And so then jail had to call the guy up again. And he comes up and he said, I'm not understanding why this room isn't okay. And so the guy says, and JL says, no, no, it needs to be, you need to move the trash out of here. So he sends a boy up with a broom who completely, who opens the second floor window and throws it out down on the people below. And um, JL said, well, I thought this was an air conditioned room. And the man said, it is air conditioned. And we looked up, of course, and the fan had one blade on it was going, whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I really feel like he say, he thought the my... trips were more spiritual. That he thought the trips were more yeah. spiritual if we yeah, suffered. Those, if he suffered more, right? Those are hard things to endure. What? Uh, this is the last question, Pat. What is the craziest thing JL asked you to do that maybe you just had to put your hands up and say, "No, I am not doing that." And I should insert another jailism here that he stole from someone else, I'm sure. But it was the preach prayer die at a moment's notice and not necessarily in that order. But which one of those did he ask you to do at a moment's notice? Uh, I think that was the one where we were with the uh, warriors in Kenya. And JL said that I had to come in and eat with them, even though women weren't allowed to eat with the warriors. Um, the men ate first, and then the women, if there was any food left over, the women and children got to eat it. So, But he wanted me to have some food. So we went in, and we all sat on the floor, and there was one table in the middle. Every man there had brought in his machete, which I had no idea what that would mean. But anyway, on the table was this big five-gallon bucket with a doily on top of something that it was covering. I didn't know. And so after the blessing was said and the doily was taken off, this whole herd or flock or something of flies, whatever a group of flies is called, just ascended above the bucket. And, and upside down in the bucket were uh, goat legs that had been roasted. So they were kind of all around in a circle. So every man grabbed his goat leg and uh, JL grabbed one too. And I thought, Oh no, I hope there's only enough for each man. But JL was going to be willing to share it with me, of course, to eat <laughs> with them, to show how much we could identify with them. And so they would take the goat leg and put it up to their mouth and then take their machete and then saw off a piece and then chew. They chewed for a long time, I tell you. Yeah, so how, anyway, how much was it actually cooked? <laughs> it, it, well, it was pretty much roasted on the inside, but the reason there were so many flies is because there was so much blood in the bucket. Sorry, that's not mm. very thoughtful of me to say. <laughs> but All I can say is I've been on that trip, too, and I've seen that bucket, and it sure didn't look cooked to me. Yeah, it lives rawish. rawish. It was still making animal noises. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, he was he borrowed the machete and he he had his thing where he sawed it off in his mouth and I asked if it was possible. I mean, I felt like I was intruding with the men's meeting and mm. I would just go out and sit with the women if it was okay with him and he let me go. He let me go, but he also he was very adventurous in food. He would eat anything that anybody right. put in front of him and that's why all those cooks over there still miss him. Because he would have seconds, and and so I, sometimes I can't they imagine served... that prolonged his life either. <laughs> well, I don't know. So anyway, um, yeah, it's at during the times that he and I were served in a private room. 
he would eat my plate too and give me his empty plate. So it looked like we had both eaten. <laughs> so he was very kind with that. And I'm sorry if any internationals are listening because we appreciate all their <laughs> hospitality. It's just right. that I was not as brave as, and he loved it. No, he didn't even fake it. He loved it. Our weak American stomachs can't handle. Yeah, all yeah, of those we're foods. wimps. That is we're really good. wimpy. Right. Well, Pat, thank you so much for your time here uh, with us today, and uh, it was great to hear some of these stories. And I'm sure our partners enjoyed uh, hearing some of those as well, as many of them probably haven't heard. And so. Really, just uh, on behalf of everyone, we just want to thank you for your faithfulness uh, over the 55 years. You know, Feed the Hunger continues upon the foundation that you and JL laid. And it was because of walking with God in faithfulness, trusting him, believing him for great things and doing new things um, and, and, and meeting all kinds of wonderful men and women of God around the world that are doing great mm -hmm. things. And so our supporters and partners, uh, prayer partners, our circle of friends have been able to to help enable them to accomplish great things for the kingdom. And so just thank you for the role that you've played in that and uh, many blessings on you uh, in this. Well, thank you. Uh, there's one more thing I'd like to say. Sure. If it's okay, there's one more thing. So we were supposed to go to the mission field at, to the Philippines um, mm -hmm. when we first got married. That was our goal. And that didn't work out. And as we looked back, and he and I would talk about it, that there's no way to account for all that was done for God's glory because it was our plan. It was never our plan. This was never our idea. And so, therefore, that was the blessing in it because that meant that God could get all the credit. So when I see how much Feed the Hunger has done in all their outreaches in all the countries and the different uh, ways that we supply, especially for at-risk children, it, it's all because of what God has done, because it certainly is nothing we can claim any kind of victory over except to give glory to God. So thank you for this Amen. interview. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Well, I trust everyone enjoyed uh, that visit with Pat. It was special to hear some of those stories. I've heard some of them before, but not all of them. And, um, and so we really are thankful for uh, Pat and Jail's legacy here with the ministry. And so that wraps up our time here today and what we have. Uh, we do want to uh, just be respectful of your time. Thank you so much for tuning in and 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 watching this and taking the time to hear the updates. Uh, just a few reminders before we part. Uh, just remember uh, ways you can engage and uh, really make a difference in, through the golf tournament, the Golf to Give Back coming up the first week in May. So we'll remind you of that. Remember, you can play from wherever you are, play your favorite course with your friends. There's a, an, a, an entry fee. Um, and then, of course, you would pay your green fees to the local course, but that entry fee is going to be converted right into meals. Uh, yeah. Also, that May Packathon that that, that uh, we're building interest for in the golf tournament will help uh, sponsor some meals at that. There's opportunities to pack uh, in, in uh, various places near near us here in central North Carolina, also in Charlotte, and then in places in uh, near Dallas and Katy, Texas as well. There'll be opportunities to pack uh, this summer with uh, and, and be involved hands on in cre creating uh, these the, we see you've heard us say this before we see the food as a tool and a resource uh, not only to meet a physical need but to share the love of Christ and the message of the gospel with those who receive it and so uh, I encourage you to take advantage of that finally uh, follow us on social media and so pay attention to us um, share out uh, the things that you enjoy and, and invite your friends to follow us on social media and uh, stay engaged with us that way. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, I'm sure, to to, to tune in and and um, and to uh, pay attention to this update and, and watch this update. And we are so thankful for your partnership and what you make possible uh, for God's glory. Yeah, and I just want to add that um, if those of you who are on our Sunday morning prayer email, or that's at least when it arrives in your inbox, you just kind of saw my heart for and concern for the, our own country right now and all the division and just upheaval. It's just a very unsettling time for our country, and that's the time for us to shine as believers. And so thank you for allowing us to be a part of how you shine in America and around the world through your partnership with us. So thanks so much. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.